Speaking of which, what kind of dance do mothers like the best? The mamba. Well done. Ba-boom. You guys can use that if you want with your mom. What did the dolphin shout when he got stuck in the seaweed? Keep it clean. We're recording. What did the dolphin shout when he got stuck in the seaweed? Kelp. All right. All right. I try. I really do. I really do. I will stick to science. I will stick to science. I mean, come on. That was kind of funny. No? All right. Some of you were forcing the laugh. Some of you were trying to suppress it. You can't help it. All right. Today we're going to talk about hearing and equilibrium. We're filling out the special senses. Before we go there, someone tell me, tell us, what are some of the differences between, between special senses and regular senses? Special senses are located in the head region. I like it. Anything else? Special senses have specific types of receptors. They're responding to specific type of stimulus. Give me an example of a general sense. Touch, proprioception. Yep, I'd use those interchangeably. What else? General senses, an example. Temperature. Anything else related to chemistry? Yeah. Uh, nociceptors? Nociceptors? Pain? Yeah, it's actually a general sense. I mean, you're like, isn't pain specific? Well, but it's all over the body. Okay, so that's your big discriminator is, is it located just in the head? Or can you find it in other places? Okay, so we're in a special sense known as hearing as well as equilibrium. So we're talking about the ear. And I, I was debating on the bonus opportunity on, on, on what, to, what to pick. And I thought maybe I'd do cochlear implants, which I, I think are really fascinating. I mean, when I was sitting in your seat, cochlear implants were like the future. There was no way you could imagine doing a cochlear implant. Okay. But they, have, they still have some issues associated with them. They don't work perfectly. Um, but I didn't go with cochlear implant. I actually went with um, uh, olfaction and, and a COVID paper. Okay? I, thought, I, I thought, well, that might be more uh, impactful to your world because you lived through that. So as we look at equilibrium and hearing, um, we're going to respond to vibrating air molecules. That's what's happening. And if you think about that, so the air is a medium. Water is a medium. Space or a vacuum, there really isn't any medium. There's the lack of medium, right? So sound doesn't travel in space, right? For all you Star Wars junkies, the, like the, the sounds of the uh, X-wing fighters and the TIE fighters don't actually exist. Those sounds don't happen because they're fighting in space. It's quiet, it's just a light show. You're like, oh, really? Yeah, but the movie's really boring without the special effects. But your voice, my voice, in air, moves air molecules and vibrates air molecules as the sound propagates. Just like when you throw a pebble into a still pond or a pool and you see the ripple effect of the waves. Sound waves do the same type of thing. If you go underwater, sound travels through water but differently. That's why your sound underwater, if you're in your pool, do you ever play this game? My brothers and I used to play this game where we like scream at each other under the water to see if you could decipher what each other was saying. And then you'd get up and you'd start punching each other. I don't know what you said, but I'm sure you insulted me, right? So air and water, there's a different way that sound travels. Equilibrium. Equilibrium is the sense of motion or body orientation and balance. 
And both of these senses reside in the inner ear. And in the inner ear, we've got this maze, fluid-filled passage and sensory cells. And essentially, those sensory cells are mechanoreceptors. The type of sensory cells and the type of receptor that we classify them as is mechanosensation. They're detecting motion or movement. The fluid is set in motion, and the sensory cell converts that motion to action potentials that travel down a nerve, or up a nerve, rather, into your brain. Pretty straightforward. So when we look at a schematic, we've got our outer ear on the left, we have our middle ear in the middle, and then we've got our inner ear on the far right. And the ear itself allows us to interact with our environment by bringing in information or cues about sound, as well as information and cues about balance or equilibrium, where we are in space. So in lab, you looked at, in the very last section, you looked at the, the ear, and we had these three bones that we referred to as the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And these three middle ear bones sit in the medium of air. Here is the eardrum, or what we refer to as uh, the tympanic membrane. And it vibrates, so you have air out here that carries air, uh, sound waves, vibrates the eardrum, moves these three ossicles or bones, vibrates the stapes that is connected to an oval window, on the other side is like your pool. This is fluid. So this is the connection between the air and the liquid. And we'll talk specifically about that liquid. Because that liquid, there's two different types. There's endolymph and perilymph. And they're very, very similar. They're, they're like a, a saline solution. But one of them salinated with potassium, and the other one salinated with sodium. And the sodium variety we're more familiar with. And we'll talk about that more as the lecture goes on. But the whole point of this is just to show a diagram or a schematic that gives you the different pieces of the puzzle as we move forward. And we'll come to a real picture here in the lecture in a moment. So what is sound? Well, these are audible vibrations of molecules. Audible vibrations of molecules. We've got um, high-pitched sounds which would be treble. Those are referred to as high-frequency sounds in the range of 7,000 to 20,000 hertz. And a hertz is just a cycle per second. So those are your high-pitched sounds, like bells, okay, um, measured in hertz. Low pitch or bass is on the order of 20 to 800 hertz. And that's the visible, or the visible, that's the auditory spectrum that we can hear. 20 to 20,000 hertz. That's our perceptible range. Loudness is different than pitch. That's the intensity measured in decibels. That's how loud something sounds. Whether it's my voice or an airplane taking off or your music through your AirPods. Decibels, loudness. If we look at this diagram, which is an artist's representation of kind of the schematic diagram that I showed earlier, here's our eardrum, tympanic membrane. This is the outer ear. These components of the outer ear that you studied in lab, I won't ask anything about those on the exam. I don't, I don't care. All it really does is to funnel the sound waves down to vibrate the eardrum. I care more that you understand the mechanism of how you hear. There are some inner ear, or sorry, middle ear and inner ear components that I do want you to know for the exam. We'll leave all of the outer ear stuff that you pierce and you do all sorts of cool things with. That's left for lab. We're talking more of the physiology of how this works, how you actually hear. And I'll give you a hint, I'll cut all the way to the end. 
Does it surprise you at the end when I tell you that the way you hear is you actually open a channel and an ion moves, and that sends an electrical signal down a nerve? Does that shock you? So that's the answer. <laughs> okay, all of this stuff is just so that you can actually move potassium. You're like, wow. This is very complex. It must mean a lot for us to actually be able to hear. Right? In biology, remember redundancy? So now you don't just have one of these. You actually have bilateral hearing. And then Wednesday we'll talk about vision and you have bilateral vision. And we already talked about olfaction and gustation. And it's technically two, but they're both chemoreceptors. So you interact with your environment chemically using taste as well as smell. So these special senses are really important to us. They're, they're duplicated. You with me? And so there are patients, I told you at the very end of the last lecture, uh, a COVID patient who's a friend of ours that lost hearing in one of their ears, Fortunately, they still have hearing on the other side. You know, and as we age, our hearing dissipates. And maybe your parents or your grandparents are in that category. But all of this structural material is to move an ion. That's what its purpose is. And I sometimes feel like the end game is important to see. Yeah, I spoiled it, but I wanted you to follow the story today as we're unfolding everything. Because it can be complex. But if you know where you're headed, I think it's easier to pay attention. So three smallest bones in the body, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And in, in the old terminology, they were the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. But we've moved away from that terminology and refer to it as malleus, incus, and stapes. And these ear ossicles, or these ear bones, are literally just to connect one membrane to another. They're connecting one membrane to another. And then you notice that there's this auditory tube, or what's known as the eustachian tube, which actually um, terminates in the back of the throat, in the nasopharynx. And <clears throat> what's the purpose of, of this tube that goes into this middle ear? What's the purpose of that tube? No idea? It's to equalize the pressure. So when you travel to Phoenix and back, right, and you, you have to do that weird thing with your mouth, you're like, oh, it just popped. That's what you're doing. You're equilibrating the pressure between your middle ear and the outside atmosphere. And because you move from basically like 1,500 feet to 7,000 feet, atmospheric pressure changes. And so that's what you have here. Now, what happens when you get an ear infection? Where is the infection? Typically, it's in here. And it can be any of this that's infected, including the eardrum or what we refer to as the oval window. What about, how many of you had tubes in your ear when you were younger? Okay. Like, where is that? That's right here. And your anatomy at that age this was probably compressed or confined, and so you couldn't equilibrate very well. And when you would swim, you'd get water up your nose. It would go up the eustachian tube. It didn't actually come in your ear. It actually came up your nose, and it, pool water would sit there, and it couldn't drain, and so you'd get an infection. So they put tubes in here so that that would drain. Punctured or ruptured eardrum, anybody had that? Okay, should stop putting pencils in your ear. No, but, but like really high decibel sounds can do it. Uh, gunfire, um, loud popping noises of any sort. Uh, these will heal. It's actually quite painful, right, to rupture your eardrum. It will heal, not always, depending upon the ex uh, extent of the tear. Uh, but this is all very, very sensitive, and that's why for a lot of uh, working or manufacturing jobs, we're now having folks wear earplugs or personal protective equipment, which includes, you know, like earmuffs. You, you go to the airport and you see the people out there on the tarmac. They're protecting the sensitivity of these structures. 
questions on how things set up. We're going to cover the inner ear at the end. I just want to get all the way to the inner ear, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk. But in the inner ear, some of the main components that you can't really see here is you've got um, the oval window, which is behind the stapes. And that is the opening to um, the cochlea. And we'll, we'll start talking about the cochlea and this bony labyrinth, um, as well as perilymph, endolymph, and the vest vestibule, or the structures that make up the inner ear. So as we dive in, we are here at the oval window. So if I back up, the beginning of the oval window is right behind the stapes. So if you took that off, this is what you would see behind it. And this is the cochlea, which looks like a snail. And if you stretched it out lengthwise, you'd have like a top, a middle, and a bottom tube. The top tube is the scala vestibuli, and it circulates within at perilymph. The middle tube is the cochlear duct, and this has the endolymph. And then the bottom tube is the scala tympani, which also has perilymph. And <clears throat> this circulates in this direction, and if you stretch this out, I'll show you a slide in a minute, the reason that it's, it's curled up is you have hair receptors, sensory receptors, in the beginning, in the middle, and at the very end that respond to different frequencies of sound. And because your cochlea is wound up, your inner ear doesn't have to stick out, you know, like, like this far out of your head to have these tubes of fluid. You just roll it up and pack it within the bony structure, which is, makes a lot of sense. So you can imagine other organisms that have Keener senses of hearing might have more hair receptors. They might have more robust cochlea that are a larger spiral. A bigger component of real estate within the bony cranium designated to house these structures. You can see the nerves coming off of here. And if I blow this up down here in the lower left, that's this little window, which is focused in the cochlear duct, the main duct. And here are the nerves, the fibers of the cochlear nerve that are coming out of here. And we'll get to that in a minute. And you can appreciate how there's this hair cell. And this hair cell actually has these stereocilia, which are actually embedded in this tectoral membrane. They're actually physically stuck in there. And we'll come back to that here in a second. So if we continue this theme, the organ of Cordy, this organ of Cordy, I'm looking for it, where is it? Our supporting cells. Why did it not? That's weird. Well, the organ of Cordy, I guess it doesn't highlight it um, here, is made up of the hair cells and the supporting cells. So we're, we're actually right in this diagram of the organ of Cordy. And that, that terminology will probably fade because it's named after somebody. But it encompasses our hair cells, which are in um, a darker purple. And the supporting cells are the lighter colored pink that don't have the stereocilia protruding out. So the stereocilia are on the hair cells which are the receptors that actually connect to the portions of the fibers of the cochlear nerve. So this is where the magic's going to happen as we unpack this a little bit more. So as we look at hearing and how this works, essentially back to this diagram, we need to vibrate that eardrum to then move these three bones, to then move or vibrate this membrane, 
that's going to produce ripples in the fluid of the scala um, tympani, the scala uh, vestibuli, as well as the cochlear duct. You with me? So <clears throat> when the stapes moves, oops, sorry. Trying to go back. Here's our stapes. We've got sound coming in, moves the eardrum, moves the malleus, connected to the incus, connected to the stapes, moves the stapes. As it moves the stapes and vibrates the stapes, <clears throat> you start pushing on the perilymph of the scale of vestibuli, the top one. This pushes down the vestibular membrane. The vestibular membrane is the division between the scala vestibuli and the cochlear duct. And that ultimately pushes on the endolymph, the endolymph within the cochlear duct. <clears throat> this pushes down on the bacillar membrane, and it actually pushes pressures on the scala tympani of the perilymph. So you're conducting this propagation of waves as you move sound. If we zoom in to this location here and we look at our organ of Cordy, we see our stereo cilia. And this is in an unstimulated state. <clears throat> they have these little fibrous proteins that connect the stereo cilia together, known as a tip link. So it's a filament protein. <clears throat> it's very, very similar to um, the elastin filament, or what we refer to as titan. Very, very similar type of structure. It connects all of those stereocilia together. And as the vibration moves the stereocilia, all of those actually push over together because they're all linked. If we zoom in, to the very tip, and we're looking at a membrane, here we've got a potassium gate, and there's a mechanical connection between that tip link and the door of the gate. And as the stereocilia are deflected, it pushes the gate open and allows potassium to flow in, and this is what's responsible, this influx of potassium, is what's responsible for creating a voltage-gated ion potential. In muscle physiology and nerve physiology, everywhere in the body, we actually saw what molecule do this? Sodium. Here, we actually have potassium that's high outside the cell, moving into the cell. That's what's actually re uh, responsible for stimulating the action potential within the hair cell. So it's kind of a cool twist of what we've been learning. Same processes, but instead of the ion or the cation sodium, you substitute the cation potassium. Why? Because in the endolymph, this is a high potassium fluid. In the scale of vestibuli, the perilymph in the scale of tympani, this is high in sodium, but it's high in potassium within the cochlear duct. Now somebody's going to ask me, why? That I don't know. This is just how it's set up. And because this is potassium, when you move potassium into the cell is what's responsible for creating your action potential within the hearing cell. Question. What's the, what's the internal cation? Inside here? Uh, there's sodium, there's chloride, there's potassium. They're just in different concentrations, like what we saw in muscle. But what I care about you knowing for the exam is at the level of the stereocilia that are connected by this fibrous protein known as the tip link, when you have mechano sensation of sound waves moving the air, vibrating the eardrum, or tympanic membrane, moving your ear ossicles, vibrating another membrane 
leading to the movement of perilymph, ultimately leading to the movement of endolymph. Ultimately, it's a potassium gate that opens. Potassium comes in, and that's what's responsible for sending the action potential down the cochlear nerve. Do you follow that? Oh, pitch. We're going to talk about that here on the next slide. The question was, are there variations of this depending upon the pitch? There's, all of this is the same. What's different are the individual receptors and where they're found. So this is a representation if you had the cochlea stretched out. Okay, so you can see that it's some distance longer than what it's been in these kinds of pictures. So imagine this rolled out, which is what we're looking at right here. And if you take this rolled out and you insert over top of it, things that are closer in versus things that are at the tip of the uh, curl, you with me? Or like the inner part of the curl versus the outer part of the curl. So this would be the inner part of the curl. This would be the outer part of the curl, or maybe the beginning of the curl and the end of the curl. So if you roll that out, and then you look at low frequency, low frequency, 20 to 80, 800 hertz base is here. Mid-range is in the middle. High frequency, high pitch is right at the beginning. So those are the specialization of the individual hair cells, all that utilize potassium influx to stimulate an action potential. Kind of cool, right? Just how it works. So now we have the ability to discriminate different types of sounds. Now how about, how about our, our, our family dog that can hear sounds that you can't hear? What's happening there? Well, the high frequency sounds, right? This is longer. It's more robust of a cochlea. You have more individual hair cells that can detect a broader range of frequencies. Answer your question? All right, how about deafness? So we've got two different types that I want you to think through or be prepared to, to describe. And hopefully you can appreciate this uh, figure that there's a shaded region that refers to uh, the conductive hearing loss, which involves the outer ear as well as the middle ear. There's another shaded region here, which is sensor, uh, sensoneural hearing, where you have an issue with the propagation of the sound wave or something within the inner ear. So most often, individuals that are born non-hearing have a dysfunction at the level of the organ of cordy. So it's sensoneuronal. Either the stereocilia cells do not form or the nerve on the back end doesn't actually connect fibers to the stereocilia or to the hair cells. Okay, those are individuals that are born non-hearing. And that would be referred to as uh, sensor neuronal hearing loss. Or you've got an issue associated with the inner ear. Someone who has conductive hearing loss, whether it's wax uh, or whether it's a ruptured membrane, um, you could have uh, problems with the bones where they actually uh, become stiff and rigid or inflamed as we get older. Otosclerosis, which happens with age. Okay. Questions over sensoneuronal versus uh, conductive. I'm going to show you a video in a second, which is going to kind of recap everything that I talked about within hearing, and then we'll switch to equilibrium. But I want you to be able to appreciate or understand 
So cranial nerve 8, which is referred to as the vestibular cochlear nerve, and I think you should know that. I think you should know cranial nerve 8, vestibular cochlear nerve. The vestibular apparatus we haven't talked about. The cochlea we just got done talking about. So the cochlear part is for hearing. The vestibular part is for balance and equilibrium. And look at all of these different locations that I just want you to be um, appreciative of, not necessarily memorize for the exam. I just want you to kind of look at this from a global standpoint and say, yeah, now I can kind of understand why we looked at all those different regions of the brain. And when we talk about association tracks or information coming into the brain and going into different spots in the brain to integrate information, do you remember like the thalamus is this major relay center? It's taking information in and sending it all over the brain. So I wouldn't anticipate a question showing this picture and you needing to know the map of all the different pathways. This is just more for you to look at this and go, yeah, in retrospect, I remember we were all throughout here. And now you've got a specific uh, piece of sensory information that's coming in. And it comes in via cranial nerve 8, vestibular cochlear nerve, which I do want you to understand and know. And then it sends it to, you remember the inferior colliculus? So the su superior and the inferior colliculi. The superior was for vision. We'll look at that um, uh, Wednesday. The inferior collicul colliculus, was, which gave you that ability to track where that sound is coming from. Like the ambulance that's getting closer, and you're like, oh, it's coming at me. Like, you're not doing a physics calculation to determine that the ambulance is getting closer because the sound waves are actually shortening. Your inferior colliculus is processing that sound information saying, I think that's coming towards us versus moving away from us. And you've got your primary auditory cortex, right? Here's our thalamus, comes through the thalamus, and then send out to the primary auditory cortex where you actually process the information to say, hey, what am I going to do with this, right? And this auditory cortex is part of that post-central gyrus in the parietal lobe. Y'all with me? All right. That alphabet soup is for me to show this video. What ions? The chemicals bind Potassium. to the auditory nerve cells and create an electrical signal which travels along the auditory nerve to the brain. Different hair cells respond to different frequencies of sound. The hair cells at the base of the cochlea detect higher pitched sounds, such as a piccolo or flute. The hair cells toward the top of the spiral detect progressively lower pitched sounds, such as a trumpet or trombone. At the very top or apex of the spiral, the hair cells detect the lowest pitched sounds, such as a tuba. The auditory nerve carries the electrical signal to the brain, which interprets the messages as sounds that we recognize and understand. <laughs> So 
so cute, but you can follow it, right? Makes sense. Some of the details that we talked about in lecture it left out. Didn't talk about what the ion was. Didn't talk about the tip link, right? Didn't talk about the difference between perilymph and endolymph. So there's a lot of details in that NIH video that we covered that it didn't. But I think showing you a video of how it works helps you to visualize it. Okay? So I did re-upload the uh, lecture slides because that's that uh, video is it wasn't in the uh, the old one. So that's the only difference. If you wanna if you wanna grab that video and watch it again, it's it's in the link. Okay, or you can just watch this video that's on YouTube. So let's go to um, <clears throat> Before we go to equilibrium, let's talk a little bit about cochlear implants. So one of the biggest complaints, my father actually has a cochlear implant uh, on his right side. And um, one of the biggest complaints of patients that receive cochlear, cochlear implants is it sounds like, uh, and this might be difficult for you all to um, uh, identify with or recognize, maybe you've seen movies, but the old radios that were dial, if you weren't quite on the station, you get a lot of static, okay? And it was the same thing with, uh, uh, in the old days, tele over-air television sets. Not HDTV, but analog TV with the rabbit ears and all that. Um, if you weren't in a station, you would get like a crackling static sound. And so that's the information that patients initially report with a cochlear implant, is we're taking, you're taking in sound waves, and what the cochlear implant does is it replaces the outer ear and the inner ear. And the component of uh, outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear component that creates the electrical signal. So it's receiving the sound waves, and it's sending out an electrical impulse at different pitch frequencies and different decibel levels. And it sends it right into cranial nerve 8. And so it's going to send the signal of electricity, low voltage electricity. And you've got a biomedical device that's sending electrical information into a biological nerve. And what the patient hears is like a crackle. I mean, what my dad tells me in the very beginning, it was like. And then you, tra you have to train your brain to interpret different sounds and how they correspond to different words. So you, you're retraining your brain. At the same time, you're getting conflicting information from the other ear if you only have a unilateral cochlear implant. So a lot of audiologists or occupational therapists will tell patients, as you're practicing, as you're training your brain, take out your hearing aid in your, good, in your other good ear. It's not really a good ear. It has a hearing aid. But take out your hearing aid in your non-cochlear implant ear so that you can just practice training the information on your cochlear implant. So it, it's a lot of reprogramming, and usually it's in older patients, which can get very frustrating for our geriatric patient population. Okay? But take any population that's not hearing. It can be very frustrating if you can't interact. Okay? If you can't see well, you can't hear well, you can't taste, you can't smell, you don't have your special senses, it impacts your quality of life in a big way. Patients get grumpy, and rightfully so. Okay, so just recognize that when you're working in the future with your patients. Um, it's hard for us to relate to them because we, we don't have those problems, right? And if you do, you actually will probably be that much better of a healthcare provider because you can have the empathy with your patient, whether it's you don't see very well, you don't hear very well, or you have a loved one that's that way. I mean, my dad um, uh, really wrestles with his hearing, and it's made me a lot more empathetic about patients that have problems um, with all sorts of other different types of uh, special senses. Well, he also has a problem with balance, and they are related, okay, because we're still talking about the inner ear. So I put this picture back up. This is another modification to the slide deck that's probably... Um, not in your uh, device if you downloaded it the other day, because I, I just wanted to reframe where we are. We're still talking about the inner ear with equilibrium. 
But we're shifting up here. You can see the cochlear nerve has kind of these projections. And some of the projections move over to the cochlea, and the other projections move over to this structure, which is called the vestibular apparatus. And that's why we refer to this as the vestibular cochlear nerve. And it shares this information. I don't know why. I actually think it would have been better design, in my opinion, I'm trying to be humble about it, but to have a separate nerve that does balance from hearing. Because a lot of patients that have hearing issues have balance issues and vice versa. Okay, so I think it would have corrected a lot of those problems. But again, it's a question I'll have to ask some other time, right? To someone that knows more information than I do. But our balance. So we've got this vestibular apparatus, and it's made up of two main structures. The semicircular ducts, which are very easy to spot. There's these swooping, and if you look at them, it's quite interesting. They're in the X, sorry, Y, X, as well as Z direction. So you have a canal that's basically like a 3D map of where you are in space. And that canal is full of fluid, and that fluid will move within that canal system. So the semicircular ducts will give you information about angular acceleration. The saccule and the utricle um, are found more in the vestibula or in the, an the entrance, if you will, before you get over to the semicircular ducts. And you've got a, um, a utricle and a saccule. And these give you information about static equilibrium or linear acceleration. We'll give some examples of each, but first, Let's look at the saccule and the utricle. So the saccule and the utricle, you've got this structure. Let's start down here with the nerves. And this one is actually the macula utricle. And this one in the uh, vertical direction is the um, macula sacculi. So we've got the vertical direction is the sacculi. The horizontal direction is uh, the utriculi. And you've got hair cells, again, just like what we saw before. The hair cells are connected to the nerve fibers all around the hair cells that don't have the nerve connections. And they don't actually have um, um, anything projecting out, stereocilia, into this otolithic membrane, which is like a piece of jello. Okay, can you imagine kind of a piece of jello where, you know, you set it on a plate and then you can move the plate and the jello kind of you move the plate like this and the jello goes Roop. Does that make sense? And you move it this way and the jello goes Roop, like that. Um, if you could invert and and hold it in the vertical direction and you kind of did this, it would go Roop. That's exactly how this behaves. And as this otolithic membrane moves with your motion, it causes a force deflection because it's weighted down by these otoliths. These otoliths are structures that are made up of a calcium carbonate, and they're like granules, and they give kind of a substance or a weight to the jello. So it's like when grandma made jello or mom made jello and put like fruit inside of it. You know, like cherries and strawberries. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Or pieces of, you know, some of you are like, it's gross, Keller. Yeah, but it's just a good representation of what this looks like. But it gives it, when you move the plate, it gives it more mass to deflect. So these otoliths, calcium carbonate crystals, are embedded within the otolithic membrane and give it a mass. So when you have motion, the otolithic membrane shifts, the hair cells deflect and causes stimulation of the nerve directly. So when we're talking about the saccule and the utricle, we're referring to static equilibrium and linear acceleration. So static equilibrium would be like where you're sitting right now in your chair. You know, you're, you're 
your otolithic membrane is just kind of stationary, right? You shift in your chair a little bit, and it does kind of that. Shift in your chair again, it does kind of that. Or you're at a stoplight, it turns green, and you could close your eyes in a car, right, and know about what's happening, even though you can't see. You can feel the acceleration. You can tell about how fast you're going. You know if the car is turning right. You know if the car is turning left. That's these structures. That's that jello on that plate. You're gathering information about where your kidnapper is taking you, even though you can't see that, right? I'm talking about these movies, right? The, the murder mystery movies where the person's kidnapped and all of a sudden, you know, they figure out where they are. They had to find my phone and they didn't turn off the find my phone. But information about static equilibrium as well as linear acceleration. Now, in contrast, the semicircular ducts, at the beginning or the entrance of the semicircular ducts are these structures known as a crista ampullaris, a crista ampullaris. And there's endolymph that flows throughout these canals. And this gives you information about rotational um, acceleration, angular acceleration. So uh, one of our daughters is actually a ballerina. And, and so this is the one where um, I always marveled when she was little, and now you know that she's older and doing it. Um, I, I understand it a little bit better, but they can actually they'll train themselves to focus on a spot uh, just off the stage. And they'll do their turn and come back to that same spot. And they're always looking for that same spot. So when they stop spinning and they're standing mid-stage, smiling at the Nutcracker performance, you know, I'd be like this right, and fall over. It's these structures where that endolymph is moving, right, and you can do this. Our, our puppy chases her tail, and it's really hilarious. I'll try to get a video of it and see if I can uh, send it or show you. Uh, she chases her tail, and then when she's done chasing her tail, she's like drunk. She's like, whoa, right, and then she's like, oh, there it is again, right, and then she'll do it again, and she doesn't figure out to go the opposite direction. She only does it in one way, but she literally stands there like she's drunk and looks at me like, what happened? And she still hasn't figured it out, which is hilarious. But that's this motion. That's this sensation when you spin in circles and then you stop and everything's still moving. The endolymph is still moving in those canals. And it's pushing on the crista ampullaris, which is a gelatinous mass at the top. That's the cupula, similar to the otolithic membrane, but no otoliths. And it sits on top of our hair cells that are stuck within it. And as the endolymph moves, it moves, the crista ampullaris, the fluid moves, creates kind of drag on the crista ampullaris. You get a mechanical deflection of the hair cells that sends an action potential down the nerve. So as you're spinning, you're that ballerina on that stage doing that spin, they still have that dizzy sensation. It's just not as aggressive because you and I don't have that training of finding a point off stage that we, we're getting visual cues as well as endolymph swirling our crista ampullaris that combine give you that spinning sensation that creates that nausea. Another example, I'll go to your question is, uh, how many of you got car sick when you were younger? or still get car sick, okay, big time. What was the number one thing that helped? The position in the car where? Sit in the front seat, right? You're like, sweet, mom, dad, I'm, I think I'm going to puke. I need to sit up front, right? Come on, some of you faked it. You're like, I think I'm, I'm going to throw up, dad. All right, fine, I'll climb in the back, right? Because when you're sitting in the middle or the third row, if you had a big family like us, you know, there were, you know, loser kids that sat in the third row, right? The little ones always are like, we're always in the third row, right? The youngest always got the third row. You're getting all of this visual motion coming at you. Whereas you sit in the front, it's much muted. It's more straight at you. Things aren't moving quite as fast. And so that's why that trick works. Question. Oh, I answered. Okay. Was it a car sick question? 
We got a wife and I. Last slide for today, but stick around. You're going to want some information here in a second. Again, similar to the slide that I showed you for hearing, I don't expect, you won't see a picture like this on the exam in our images with me trying to trick you into what's what. You might see a brain image, and I want you to identify major areas of the brain, like from a review standpoint. So I would know that. But I'm not going to put this up there. I just want an appreciation as we wind down the semester for you to see where we've been. And now that we're talking about the vestibular apparatus and the cochlea, and we're talking about the vestibular cochlear nerve, otherwise known as cranial nerve 8, that this information that's coming in from the vestibular apparatus comes into the cerebrum, which gives us information about motor coordination, right? It comes into um, the nuclei for controlling eye movements, like the colliculi. It comes up here into the thalamus, which is the relay center, goes up into the cortex that gives you an awareness of orientation and movement of where you are. That's that ex example of you're riding in the car, you know, and you're playing with your siblings, like, hey, where, where do you think we're going? Close your eyes and let's see if we can figure out who, where we are in town. And you can kind of count, you know, your stops and if you turn right or left and you can use landmarks in your mind of, oh, yeah, we just drove by so-and-so's house and we're by the 7-Eleven, right? And then you, did you play, play that game with your, with your brothers or sisters? Okay, maybe it was just me, right? You're all trying to figure out where you are and you know, everyone's like, oh, no, I'm not looking, I'm not looking, right? And you really know your brother's true character when you see that. But then your eyes are open, too, so you know that you're cheating, too. So I just want you to see kind of where we've been and have an appreciation for all the different centers um, of the brain. Questions before I get to maybe the meat of why everyone's hanging out this long? Vertigo. Um, so great question. There's a lot of different um, diseases that can happen within the inner ear, but one of the most common um, problems associated with vertigo or this feeling of the room spinning um, in, a, in a chronic way is you get um, the uh, breaking off of certain crystals that happen within the endolymph. And so the, you still get this swirling motion that's happening with these uh, crystals that form in the inner ear. And it happens, unfortunately, as we get older. And even though there's not much motion, you're getting a lot of stimulation of the, of the uh, crystal, crystallaris ampullus. And that's translating to movement, even though nothing's happening. There are some physical therapy, op occupational therapy uh, techniques that can be done to kind of try to recalibrate your inner ear. And some of them are very effective and work. Um, in other examples, um, there's inflammatory diseases that happen in the inner ear, and you'll get an inflammation that'll take place and cause um, constant stimulation on the vestibular portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve. That also will translate electrical impulses to the brain, giving you a sense of motion even though you're not moving. Okay, so those are probably the two biggest ones, is you get uh, calcium uh, chloride or calcium carbonate crystals that form and break off, and they float around in the endolymph, and they cause stimulation, or you get infl inflammatory uh, issues within the inner ear that cause st stimulation of the nerve, okay? Yeah, so tinnitus, constant ringing in the ears. So <clears throat> what will happen, especially like, let's say you go to a concert, super loud, okay, and you're done, you go home, and you're getting ready to go to bed, and you're still hearing the ringing. So um, it, we're at the level of the stereo cilia. We're at the level of the tip link, and we're at potassium. Because there was so much stimulation, those stereo cilia often will get sort of frozen or partially paralyzed in, an open, in a bent configuration where you've got the potassium channel open, and potassium is rushing in. And so you're still getting the sound even though the sound's gone. 
And once, you know, a few hours later or the next morning or the next day or the next week, depending upon who was playing, um, that will all have kind of subsided and every, all the physiology kind of resets and goes back to normal. 